focus on how being a little bit different helps you connect with your players and makes their learning memorable. We talk about simplifying special teams, but really getting detailed on techniques and fundamentals. And we talk about the sacrifices that it takes to really make it in this profession. And joining me to discuss all those things is Thomas Sheffield, special teams coordinator at Nevada. Coach, it's great to have you here today. Oh, man, I appreciate you uh, asking me to come on and taking the time. And uh, I look forward to to doing this thing with you, man. It's going to be a good a good little deal we do right here. Absolutely. Well, Coach, we're going to start at the beginning here. And, you know, you were sharing just how you grew up and, and where you've been to. And it's, it's you know, one of those things when you look at it, it seems like a, a long shot deal. But, um, you know, at, at some point in growing up, you know, where you did, you had this uh, idea to become a football coach. Where did that start for you? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up with a single mom. Um, like a lot of kids do. And, man, I, I latched on to uh, my high school head football coach. His name's Mike Cadell. Uh, he, he coached. He was the head coach at Axel High School for a long time. He, he now coaches um, at La Vega High School down there in tech, Central Texas. And, uh, man, it, he, he became the male role model I need. And I, I loved, man, I loved everything about football. I didn't really understand the ins and outs of it just yet, but the first – you know, memory I really have of football is just, you know, my high school head coach as a, as a youngster, just taking me under his wing and, 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 and being that male role model um, for myself. And so, you know, I, I love being in the, I love being in the offices while they were talking ball. I loved watching film and they, and he gave me the access to do all that. Now he always told me, make sure you don't repeat anything that's ever said in here, obviously, <laughs> but you know, just it, it I just loved it, man. I loved everything about it. I loved being around other football coaches. I I, I loved um, being able to learn from from great people. And and most importantly, at the end of the day, and I know it's cliche, I know it is, and we all say the same thing, but, you know, when we peel back the ego and we peel back um, everything that goes into the coaching profession, at the end of the day, I, I really truly believe we got into this thing to, to change kids' lives. And, you know, I just wanted to, I wanted to do what he did for me at the end of the day. And, and, um, you know, also football has done everything for me. Football took me from um, a trailer in Axel, Texas to I'm moving into a, a, a really nice house in Reno, Nevada. You know what I mean? It's football has changed my life. It's put me on my first airplane. It sent me to out of state, you know, it, it's done a lot for me. So I think, I believe I, I owe the game a lot, and I, I owe a lot of the people who took a chance on me. I owe them a lot. And so, you know, again, I know it's cliche, but it, if if you didn't get in this initially to change kids' lives, you're in it for the wrong reason, and you're not going to make it very long. And so as long as I can keep repaying Mike Cadell and everything he's done for me and, and just try to be um, that shining light that he was on me for some the kids that we have in our program, well, and that's what it's really about, and um, that that that's really what put me on this journey. So, coach, at some point, there became this passion for special teams, and you know, a lot of guys getting <laughs> into this game, you know, they're they they want to be the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, or the head coach. So, how did you yeah. go down this path of being the special teams coach? Well, you know, just like anybody who ever gets in this business, you know. It, you should be excelling to to coach at the highest level of college football. If you want to be a college football coach or if you want to be a high school coach or you want to coach in the NFL, you should be striving to do it at the highest level, right? And so I wanted to be an offensive coordinator. And um, I actually thought I was going to be the next great offensive coordinator. I thought I was going to be the next Urban Meyer uh, when Urban Meyer was, you know, doing what he was doing at Florida and then Ohio State. I, that's who I thought I was going to be. Right. And then I was at a, at a D three, the university of Mary Harden Baylor, and I was coaching tight ends. And this opportunity came to go to FBS at the university of North Texas with Tommy Perry, who's now at UTSA. And uh, it was a volunteer job. It was a volunteer job, but it was my, I, I always said, if I could just get my foot in the door, I could make it. Now I had never really coached special teams before. We did an interview over Skype that Skype for you young guys, that's what was uh, <laughs> Zoom before Zoom actually existed. 
Um, but we did a Skype interview. And before that interview, I got with the special teams coordinator at University of Maryland Baylor, David Branson, and and what he he taught me shield punt in about an hour, right? He taught me the ins and outs of shield punt, and so I that was my interview. I I, I did an interview with Tommy and and his his GA at the time for a volunteer job. Um, I had just gotten married. I just had a baby boy, um, but I knew I just knew, man. I, I knew that I could do it, and I knew. Um, I didn't know anything about special teams, but I knew if I got in there and I could learn it, I could do something special with it. And, uh, you know, I got to North Texas and I still wanted to coach offense. So I was kind of in and out of the special teams in the, in and out of the offensive room, but I just hustled, man. And um, I, I kind of gathered and learned from Tommy Perry um, as much as I possibly could. And then I got my first opportunity at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff to be a special teams coordinator. Um, and again, I'd only coached special teams for two years, and I really didn't coach. I was a GA. I was a volunteer for a little bit, and then I GA'd. So you really just help. You know how it is. And uh, man, we went to I went to Pine Bluff. Me and the family went to Pine Bluff, and and, and I like to think we did something special there. We changed the culture. Um, we did some things that you know, we're really proud of, and we got a punter from Arkansas Pine Bluff to the National Football League, Jamie Gillen, the Scottish Hammer. The Scottish and Hammer so, in Cleveland, yeah. Yeah, the Scottish Hammer. And so, you know, we, we I just took what I learned from Tommy, and, and I, I never, ever, ever thought that I would be a special teams coordinator. I never thought that this would be my path, but, man, at the end of the day, I'm so stoked. I'm so happy because the beautiful thing about special teams, I'm I'm one of two coaches on our entire staff that gets to coach and interact with every kid. And that's the thing I love about it the most. Yeah, it's mine, and I get to do special teams how I do it. And Nobody really breathes down my neck. Nobody really bothers me. They just, you know, our head coach trusts me, and he, t- he expects me to execute. But I love, 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 love getting to coach every single kid. There's nothing better than that, man. And, I mean, having those kids come in your office every – from from the DBs to the O-line to the D-line. That's the beautiful thing about coaching special teams. Is it is it a little nerdy? Yeah. Is it a little weird? Yeah. But I'm nerdy and I'm weird. So it was a match made in heaven. I just didn't know it yet. Well, there's been a, a philosophy and a, a delivery in how you teach, how you coach, that's really developed out of this. And, you know, you shared with me uh, probably a fact for anybody who's a special teams coordinator at any organization, at any level, is that uh, those kids didn't necessarily come to your team to play special teams. Just like we said, you know, most coaches aren't out there saying, I'm going to be a special teams coordinator. They're looking to be the head coach or the offense or defense. These guys are looking to play a position somewhere. So um, in that, you know, it wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to Nevada to play special teams, but you need them for that. And, And because of that, you've taken a different approach that it's not, always uh you know serious for you that there's a different way you deliver this so talk to us a little bit about the philosophy and the delivery that you've developed for special teams yeah you know i just i learned a long time ago at the end of the day you got to be yourself because if if you're selling something that you don't really believe in well the kids aren't going to buy it if you're if you're selling something like for example if i was selling something like Nick Saban was selling something. Well, those kids aren't going to believe it because I'm not Nick Saban. And so once I got out of the GA world and once I I stopped trying to impress everybody by being like everybody else, which is the honest truth, I I found myself in in a a way where I just, I said, forget all this, man, just go be you. Right. And, and I, I started making WWE promos for recruiting right on Twitter And I caught a lot of heck for it. And then a lot of people loved it. But the people who know me know that that's me, right? And so I just took that approach from, you know, stepping out of my comfort zone and making those promos. And and then I put it into my meeting room and I put it into the field. So, you know, if you're a special teams coach listening to this out there, just just accept that you're weird. You're a nerd. (laughs) Like, we're different. And and it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing that we're different. You know what I mean? I love that I'm different from most people on our staff. Um, but, but the thing that you got to understand is, man, let your kids see that weirdness, let your kids see that nerdiness and, and they're not going to always like it. Right. And, and sometimes it's going to be over the top, but you're going to grab your kid's attention. You know, I, I shared with you the movie full metal jacket. 
um, you know, at the beginning of that movie, the the, guy, the drill sergeant's yelling at one of these dudes in his face, and he said, ask him why he wants to be here, or why did you sign up to be in the Army, something like that. And the guy says, uh, he, I can't remember his, his, his deal, but he's like, oh, so you're a killer, huh? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, well, let me see your war face. And the guy says, what? And he says, your war face screams in his face, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so I just took that. I loved it. And I took it because I was like, man, that's crazy. And I love it. We got a culture of ride or die here. You know, we ride together, we die together. You know what I mean? We're willing to do anything and everything for our football team, anything and everything for the person next to us, including being a crazy man and running down on kickoff. For you to ask a kid to run down full speed on kickoff, you're asking him to be a crazy man, right? You're asking him to have a car crash with his body and somebody else's body. And so, you know, I just start every Friday night meeting. We, we, come, in the, we come in the meeting room. Um, they sit down, and I start that clip. We watch that clip, and then I pick on kids throughout. Even coaches will do it. Heck, our head coach, um, Coach Norvell, did it. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll get, I'll, I'll show him my war face, and then I'll ask the kid, "What would you come here for?" And he'll say, "I came here to ride or die." And I said, <laughs> "Oh, you came here to ride or die? Well, let me see your ride or die face." And we'll just start screaming at each other. But, but the beautiful thing about it is, while me and that kid are screaming at each other, showing us our ride or die face. Every other kid in the in the room is standing up, laughing, loving it, waiting to be called on. And I just think it's a it's a good start to a Friday night meeting before you go to a game. And then we do it at the walkthrough the very next morning. Um, but it, it just gets the energy flowing. It gets kids excited about what you're about to talk about. And and it, and I, I feel like you know you talked about a hook. It's your hook. You grab their attention early, and now you have it. You know what I mean? And, and again, you, you hit on the point. Nobody came to Nevada. Nobody came here to play special teams other than the specialists. So you got to convince as a special teams coach, your hardest challenge, um, your biggest challenge is to get kids excited about something they're not really excited about, something they never really saw themselves doing. And you're going to have some core guys who understand and who are mature enough to understand what special teams can do for them. Um, like I told you, I think special teams makes average players, complete players, right? right. You, you look at, you look at Alabama, the Heisman trophy winner was just the gunner on punt. Like what? Are you kidding me? But why is that? It's because he understands the big picture. He understands he might have to do that in the national football league. And if any of these kids have hopes and dreams to go on to the next level, no matter where they're at, you got to convince them and you got to show them proof that special teams is important, you know? And so you got to do that in a, in a number of ways and your delivery might just have to be a little different and, but don't be afraid to be who you are and, and, and be a little different, be a little weird, be a little nerdy. But, but at the end of the day, you're going to see results um, that, that you're getting through to the kids more than you ever were of trying to do it some other way like somebody else. That's exactly it. I love it. Well, talk to us a little bit more about uh, the ride or die culture. What, what does that mean to Nevada special teams? And, you know, what are the things that I guess these, these guys are going to hear constantly as their buzzwords and how they're going to play special teams at Nevada? Well, you know, the, start with the ride or die culture. That You know, that's something I just came up with uh, just out of the blue. You know, I, um, I just – I always loved Bad Boys, the movie Bad Boys, when they're like ride together, die together, right? And I just, I love that. And I, I just thought about what that really meant. You ride together, you die together. And, and I just applied it to, to, to special teams. And so, you know, the ride or die culture, that's all about, you know, being completely selfless, com doing anything and everything, no matter what I ask you to do, you're willing to do it for me for our head football coach for our staff for our team um you know and, and just buying in to to eliminating excuses there's a lot of things that go into it but i tell the kids all the time excuses are for losers and and we didn't bring you here to be losers and and so we, we try to incorporate that into the ride or die culture don't come to me and say oh coach i didn't make this tackle um, because you know this other guy was trying to block me and I just couldn't. No, dude. What? What? Let's go back. How should you have beat that block? What technique should you have used? Don't give me the excuse of why you didn't. What could you have done better? You know, you talk about 
on kickoff running our stick dip and replace. You know, you you set our you set the cover man or the the the, block, the kickoff return guy up. You stick him. You, you dip, eliminate that surface area, rip through that contact, and stack back on top. You know what I mean? Or you know, I just I, the, the culture is one that I just want them to understand. There's going to be a lot of things that happen in life, just like in football. And sometimes you got to do the things that you don't want to do, right? Sometimes you got to sacrifice some things you don't necessarily want to sacrifice for the better good of your family, your friends. And that's what special teams is to me. You have to make that sacrifice, right? You got to run down on kickoff and, and, and put your, put your body on the line for your team because we need you to do it. You know what I mean? Your family's going to need you to make a sacrifice someday down the road because it ain't all sunshine and rainbows out there. And I just want them to be able to take that ride or die culture over to, to real life with them. You know what I mean? And that's what we try to set it up around. And, um, and, 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 you know, the other part is just being crazy. <laughs> so I'm crazy. So I've got, dang it. I want you to be crazy. Um, you know, and that's why I like the, the ride or die face thing. I like screaming at each other. I love head button the players any chance I can get, you know, just showing them again, ride or die, no matter what, practice what you preach, go out and execute. Um, but, you know, from a, from a scheme standpoint, you know, we try to keep it extremely simple. Um, you know, I, that's a common trend I'm seeing. And so we, we try to simplify. We give them some buzzwords um, that, that they need. Like, you know, I just talked about the stick dip and replace on kickoff. Um, you know, we talk about shock lock and escape. You know, after your stick dip and replace, you get in that contact zone. You can't necessarily avoid right there. You know, th there's no avoiding in the contact zone. So what do you got to do? You got to you got to go butt a head, you got to uh, butt a guy up, shock him with your with your contact, lock those arms out, and then shed the shed the blocker while you're maintaining your leverage on that that kickoff returner and go make the tackle. You know, so shock, lock, and escape. You know, I talked about the dip and rip, all those good things. And so we just try to keep it really simple. That's part of our delivery as well. Simplicity. You know. Um, keep it simple and, and make sure it's what it's not about what I know at the end of the day. It's about what the kids know. I can come up with a million different buzzwords. I can come up with a million different techniques. I can come up with a million different schemes, but if I know it and the kids don't know it, well, it ain't going to make no difference, right? We, I mean, it ain't going to matter. We're going to go out and be really poor on special teams. And so, um, you know, it, it's a challenge, man. It's, it's such a challenge. Because especially as special teams guys, you you want to be you want to out scheme everybody. You want to you want to you, you want to create the next big thing. You know what I mean? And and you want to you want to have people asking what is what Coach Sheffield doing over there at Nevada? Why are they different? And you want it to be schematic. But at the end of the day, special teams coaches, you're there to coach technique and fundamentals. You're the take you're there to take a freshman wide receiver and turn him into a complete wide receiver who can do a little bit of everything. If, the, if for some reason your quarterback throws an interception, you know that that guy can go make a tackle because he learned how to do that on special teams. You know what I mean? Exactly. And then those guys can, those guys can be used as gunners and it, and it flips both ways. It flips both ways. Uh, you, you get an interception on defense. You want to know that your, your linebacker, your starting linebacker can go down the field, turn and, go, and plant retrace and go block somebody. And, and, and secure a block so that you can go put that thing in the end zone for a pick six. You know what I mean? So I love the idea of just creating the complete football player. And, and that's what we're trying to do here at Nevada. Love it. Well, coach, I know a, a big part of this and how you look at it, you mentioned that idea of, of simplify, right? Because we get caught yeah. up in, I mean, we do this on offense. We do it on defense. We're all guilty of it, right? Like we think we have to have more and, and that call sheet becomes like a, 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 <laughs> a, a menu at, at the Cheesecake Factory, yeah. right, with so many things on it. Yeah. But you you found the ability to get better as well as still stay creative in, in simplifying things and putting more into the details of the technique and fundamentals. Talk to us about your approach in that way. Well, you know, we, we, we peel back this, the, the scheme, and, and this is an idea I got a few years ago. During the spring ball, during spring ball, we don't put any scheme in at all. Everything is competition based, and that competition is 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 based off of how well you can execute your technique and fundamentals 
against an opposing player. That's all I care about, right? I want to see that we have great technique and fundamentals. And we haven't always done that this year. We, we didn't always do that this year, and we still got some room to grow. We got a lot of room to grow. But I love – nothing makes me happier like than, 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 than turning on some film and seeing exactly what we talk about as coaches and seeing it applied on the field, right, and from a technical standpoint. And so we don't put any steam in the spring. It's, it's strictly technique fundamentals competition, right? And I, I've stolen a lot of ideas from a lot of really, really good football coaches on how to create competition, how to create – uh, you, you know, a, 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 a awards for, for whoever wins and all this stuff to make it fun. Um, but at the end of the day, like you said, we were all guilty of creating, we could create all this scheme, but if you can't execute the technique and fundamentals that plays into that scheme, you know, it, it doesn't matter, right? So we're trying to see it as a big picture rather than a small picture. Yeah, I, I love coming up with great ideas. I love um, doing things a little different. But at the end of the day, we got to execute the technique and scheme. And it comes back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show everybody how bad of a football coach I am real quick, but it's okay. We played Wyoming this year. And, man, I, I, I knew we, we had a really special punt returner. Um, we had some really good, good guys up front that were blocking for him, all this stuff. And I just said, man, if we can just get this kid the ball, we're going we're gonna to go score a touchdown, right? Well, very first punt of the season, Wyoming punts the ball to us. Our kid takes it for 74 yards for a touchdown. And I'm like, man, I'm strutting. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm strutting the sidelines, feeling myself for a second because I was like, hey, 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 my first punt return as an FBS coordinator. Look what happened. You know what I mean? And uh, then I turned around, and our head coach is yelling at me, what's the flag for? And I said, no, please no. And, and you know what happened? We didn't use – our penalty beaters. We got these things called penalty beaters when we're in transition phase, um, you know, to, to make sure we don't hold, to make sure we don't get that notorious block in the back. That always happens. It always seems to happen on big plays. You just saw it the other night um, for um, one of the NFL games. A big return got called back. Um, for, uh, I think it was the Saints. The Saints had a kick, a punt return um, taken to the house, and it gets called back, Right. Well, why? Well, we didn't use our penalty beaters. We didn't use our proper technique and fundamentals. And as a result, that, that beautiful 74-yard punt return for a touchdown just got called back, and now we put our offense in a bad situation, right? And at the end of the day, from a special teams aspect, like our mission, our number one mission, and the thing we talk about the most, and I, most, most special teams coaches do, is flip the field, Right. Flip the field. Drive start average is everything, right? And so everybody's got the charts of the percentages and all that. And I just try to get them to understand, guys, again, I can create all the scheme in the world, but if we can't execute these fundamentals and technique, like Jay Lee right here, blocks in the back on, 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 on the 74-yard punt return for a touchdown, but why? What should you have done? You got beat early. What do we talk about? If you lose the battle, go win the war. So you got sacked by your cover man. You need to plant, retrace, back up field, and go block the most dangerous man, right? That's what we talk about. Mm -hmm. Stick that foot in the ground, turn around. Oh, crap, I've lost the battle. Well, let me go win the war. And if he just would have done that, it's our punt returner's responsibility to at least make one miss, and that was the one he would have had to make miss, and the result would have been the same, right? But it is what it is. Um, but the technique and fundamentals, man. You can't spend enough time on that stuff. You can't spend enough time talking about it. And you can't, you can't give them enough examples, whether you use DB Sport, Exos, Huddle. Man, there's ways. Technology is insane. There are ways to, to especially in this Zoom era, there's ways to create cut-ups and give those kids the information right there on the screen. You just got to type it in. You got to circle it. You got to give an explanation. But you, they get more out of that then they get you sitting up there and talking to them for 15 straight minutes. You know what I mean? Cause right. it's right there in front of them. You just got to be willing to do the work. And um, with all the technologies, it's one thing I, I want to urge the young coaches out there, man, learn all that techno technological stuff. Cause it's just going to only help you make you a better coach. And it's going to help you get your point across to your kids. It's so easy now to go into our cutups, highlight great technique throughout the season, make another cut up with that. 
and, and highlight it, circle it, put an exclamation on it, all that good stuff. And now you can send it straight out to your kids on their iPads or, or they come in and see it on the, on the computer screen, whatever it is. And, and that's, you know, it goes back to the little things. Technique and fundamentals is all about the little things. And so, you know, ride or die, practice what you preach. We got to do the little things as coaches as well. Well, Coach, I know penalty beaters were something you talked about in your clinic talk with at Lawrence first in goal. And, you know, speaking of the techniques and the, and the details in, into it, and, you know, I got to take a step back. I, uh, the other thing I thought was pretty cool, too, and I, I don't know that I've seen it done before. If I did, I just don't remember it. But um, even on the way you guys diagram things up where you're going to run a drill, uh, on, your, on your picture, on your diagram, there's yeah. cameras on there, right, showing exactly yeah. making sure that the drill is filmed from the right spot. And I, I believe fully in, in filming practice. I, I know we started doing it when I was at the high school level, I think, in, in 2003. Um, you know, we didn't even have a system to do it. I had a guy standing on a ladder, like, I mean. But, <laughs> you know, that, that yeah. point, though, you know, awesome. all of those things are important. So I, I, I love that part of it. But the penalty beaters, if you could walk us through and give us the details on – um, I think one of them I remember was like sit and fit. Um, yeah. And some of those that you have uh, to help your guys avoid getting those flags and, you know, getting that big first call as an FBS guy called back. Yeah. Well, you know, it goes back to nothing ever, nothing. It's all perfect on paper, but it's never perfect out on the field. So, you know, I, and I think most coaches do, we just try to give them, you know, worst case scenario, worst case scenario just happened. Well, what's your plan of action after that worst case scenario? You know what I mean? Or, or best case scenario, you know, you just talked about sit and fit. You know, when a, when a cover man goes to make a tackle, when he closes in on that returner, what typically happens, he goes from long stride to short stride, meaning he, he, he's going from a full sprint to coming to balance and, and, and getting in a tackling or a power position, right? Um, and a power position is something I just stole from, you know, talk about that clinic. I, I was watching um, some some replays on that clinic. Pete Limbo and uh, Drew Svoda did a good, did a really good job in their clinic, and they taught me about power position and speed position. The only two positions you ever need to talk about in the game of football. And so I'm stealing that information, and I'm going to start talking about. It. I just did it. You know what I mean? Power position, speed position. What's the difference? And when do you use those positions and, and how they're used throughout a game. But, you know, you go from a, a speed position to a power position as a cover man. Well, when he does that, we call it chop and drop. He, he chops his feet, drops his rear end to get into a tackling position. Well, that's where we're going to sit and fit. We're going to, we're going to, we're trailing one by one in his back hip pocket. When he chops and drops, we're going to take that inside hand on the hip and we're going to take that outside hand swing it across to the to the opposite peck and now we're gonna we're gonna fit on him and we're also gonna sit we're gonna sink our hips and drop our rear end and get in that power position that Pete Limbo talked about. Get in that power position right there and, and, and then that, that gives your returner some rear ends to run off of. And as you do that when you sit and fit, just understanding that the job isn't done, the technique and the fundamentals with your feet, those feet can't die. You gotta get your feet hot. And you got to continue to widen that guy, continue to be powerful and widen him out. And then, you know, what happens when your, your cover man goes to take a shot? Meaning he, he doesn't break stride. He, goes, he never goes from long stride to short stride. Well, then what do you do? Because if he doesn't chop and drop, well, heck, you can't sit and fit. So then that's where we put in the high wall. And that's just, you know, again, you're ripping through his, you're ripping through his uh, chin, boxing out, spreading your eagle wings, your eagle wings making sure that, you know, he can't come back across your – cut back across your face um, and, and come back in and make a tackle. And um, then the last one is, you know, it, it happens more times than not. You know, you, you, you don't do well at the line of scrimmage or, you know, you're just in a bad matchup and, and a guy stacks you, you know, cover man stacks you. Well, if you keep chasing his, his butt, well, what's he gonna, what are you going to end up doing? You're going to block him in the back. So what we tell our kids is, Hey man, you lost the battle early. There's still an opportunity for you to go win the war. Put it on our our punt returner. All right, worst case scenario happens. Punt returner, you got to make one miss. It is what it is. That's your job. You're the best athlete we got. Go make one miss. Meanwhile, while you're doing that, 
our 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 R2 or R3, whoever it is, he's going to stick that foot in the ground, plant, retrace back up field, and go block the most dangerous man. I've heard of, I've heard it called a lot of different things, uh, next level fast, whatever. We just call it plant and retrace um, to MDM. But um, you know, just making sure they understand. Again, it goes back to technique and fundamentals, man. Technique and fundamentals. If you can do that, you can build a complete football player. You're going to have a lot of success as a special teams coordinator. Coach, I know before we got talking, you know, you were thinking back to just to the beginning for you and, you know, what's, you know, the things, main things that have gotten you to this point. And for you, it's, it's um, kind of, you had an understanding that uh, this profession is not for the weak and that you have to make sacrifices along the way. What, what yeah. kind of things really, you know, in, in that regard, as, as you mentioned that, that big picture idea, um, you know, what kind of things were you focused on? What was your mindset? How did you, I guess, work through some of those tough times as well with, with, uh, that idea in mind that you had to make some sacrifices? Well, I've, I've been extremely lucky in my coaching profession. I have worked for some of the best head coaches in the country, Willie Fritz, Coach Willie Fritz, who's at Tulane, gave me my first opportunity. Um, then, then I got an opportunity to go work for Coach Pete Fredenberg at Mary Harden Baylor, the the powerhouse Division Three there in Central Texas. Then I got to go work for Dan McCarney um, at North Texas. It didn't work out there, and then Coach Seth Luttrell came in, and, and then I got to work for a guy named Cedric Thomas, first time head coach at Arkansas Pine Bluff, and then finally, you know, I'm here with Coach Jay Norvell. And the biggest thing that I've learned from all of them, and I did not understand this as a, as a young coach, it's always about the process. And, and I, I started learning that, and, and I started more than anything um, being blue collar. And that's not going to apply to everybody, you know, but Coach Willie Fritz, I, man, like I told you, I wanted to be the next best offensive coordinator in the country. I wanted to be the next Urban Meyer. I wanted to be the next big thing. And I, and I, had a meeting with uh, Coach Fritz, and I'm pretty sure after that meeting, he was like, what the heck? Um, because I said, man, I can do this, I can do that, I can I can do it all, not knowing anything about this business, right? So what did Coach Fritz do? He humbled me. He put me in the equipment room, and that's really how I started my coaching career. I was washing clothes at Sam Houston State while also um, being a student coach on the side, so I would be in the equipment room half my time, and then you know the rest of the time I was doing uh, data input. I was helping um, Coach Conway, Jeff Conway, who's also at Tulane. I was helping him with whatever he needed help with. Man, I was setting up bags. I was just setting up drills. Whatever I had to do, I was going to do. But I didn't understand it. You know what I mean? And um, I learned early on. I was lucky enough to learn early on in my career that it takes a blue-collar mentality. It takes a lot of sacrifice, um, a lot of sacrifice. And, and the last thing, man, it, 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 it takes, if you really want to make it, you got to put your ego to the side. Man, I was so mad. I'm going to be honest with you. I was so mad that I was in the equipment room. I didn't understand what Coach Fritz was doing. Like, man, I, here I am thinking I'm going to be the next big thing, right? And this guy's got me in the equipment room. But it taught me so much, man. It taught me work ethic. It taught me it showed me how much I really wanted to do this. Um, and, and I had to put my ego to the side. And again, I was just a dumb kid. I didn't know anything. Um, and I quickly learned that, but just understanding that this is going to take a lot of stack. If you want to be, it doesn't matter what level you're at, high school, college, NFL. If you want to be the best, if you want to be one of the best, one of the elite, then you're going to have to make a lot of sacrifices. Um, you know, we went up to AFDA one year and, uh, man, I slept in the, I had an interview for Texas state and West Virginia for GA jobs at Texas state and West Virginia. Well, I couldn't afford a hotel room after the flight. Um, and, and my buddy who was, I, I was going to get to stay with, he wasn't getting there till the day after that I got there. So the night before my Texas state and West Virginia interviews, I slept in an airport, man. I slept on a on a, a chair in the airport when I landed. I got changed. I got changed in in, in the uh, bathroom there. I took an Uber to to the hotel where I was doing my interview. 
but man, it wasn't comfortable to sleep in an airport. It's not what I wanted to do, but I, I knew, man, I always believed if I could get my foot into this door, I'm going to have a lot of success. And I knew if I would just sacrifice, I would have a lot of success. I didn't get those jobs. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I didn't get either one of those jobs, but two weeks later, I get a call from North Texas and I get an interview at North Texas and the rest is history. You know what I mean? But little things like that, man, going days, just doing whatever it takes to, to, to be successful. If you really want this, well, then go out and get it done and be, be willing to sacrifice whatever is needed. And, and, you know, the most important part, whether you're, you're married, got a girlfriend, whatever, make sure you got a great support system. And, you know, the cliche is, oh, I had a lot of doubters. I had a lot of doubters. Man, I'm be honest with you. I didn't have a lot of doubters. I had a lot of people who believed in me. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm lucky. Now, there are people who passed on me for jobs for whatever reason. So I guess in my mind, I used to think those were the haters <laughs> or whatever, the, the, the non-believers in me. Um, they weren't. I just wasn't the right fit for their system at that time. But um, get a good support group around you. I got, I got no offense to everybody else's wife out there. I got the, I got the most ride or die wife in the world. And then again, that's cliche, but she's so ride or die, man. She, she fully supported me. We, we just got married. We had a baby boy. She's a first time mom. And I leave, I, I go take a job at North Texas with her blessing, of course. But I mean, we had no money. I did. It was a volunteer job. Right. But again, I just, I knew if I could make it, if I could get my foot in the door, I could make it. I did a volunteer job for six months and she fully supported us. Now we go back to sacrifice during that time, during that time, I slept in my office. I had, I had a nice little office at, at North Texas and every night I'd put my air mattress in there and, and that's where I would sleep. You know what I mean? And it wasn't comfortable with, with cleaning people coming in and out, you know what I mean? But I had to do what I had to do. I ate peanut butter and jelly and ramen. This is no joke. For one month straight, for one month straight, every single meal, I ate peanut butter and jelly during that time. You know what I mean? And, um, it, and, and I was able to afford that peanut butter and jelly because of her. You know, she, she, she worked full time, took care of our son full time while I was at North Texas, just, just trying to work my way up. And so, you know, just if you can't sacrifice, if you're not willing to do whatever it takes, if you're not willing to take that equipment manager job just to get your career started, well, then this ain't going to work out for you. And uh, it's unfortunate, but you better go find something else to do. If you can't handle um, rejection, if you can't handle being fired, um, if you can't handle um, not getting the job you want, well, this ain't the profession for you. It's not for the weak. You got to sacrifice, 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 no matter what, man. My last story about sacrifice, when we finally got to move my wife and my son to, uh, to North Texas, we, I, I'd just been elevated to a GA. So we, we got a little money in our pocket. We got enough money to move from Temple, Texas to Denton, Texas. We put all of our money into the U-Haul. <laughs> we put all of our money into um, paying the, the first month's rent. When we got to North Texas, me and my wife looked at our bank account. We had negative $27 in our bank account, our only bank account. And what we did is uh, we, didn't, we didn't have any plans for dinner. We had no plans for dinner. And I was just like, babe, I don't know what we're going to do. And, uh, man, we just we, – we, we got online. And this, is, this isn't very good of me. But we got online, and uh, we ordered Papa John's to my already – red bank account and it just it just happened to it just happened to work man we sat in our living room our, our uh, the living room of our new place with me her and my son and we we ate our pizza and started unpacking but you talk about scary times man you talk about a very easy time to give it up a very easy time just because i could have taken any texas high school job i wanted um i was actually offered a high school head coaching job once and i turned it down and it was going to make $80,000, but I wanted to make the $1,500. I wanted to make $1,500 at the University of North Texas and continue to work my way up the way Coach Fritz, Coach Fredenberg, those, those, those mentors of mine 
showed me how and taught me how to do that. You know what I mean? And um, be a fly on the wall, man. Just soak up every every bit of knowledge. Knowledge is the best thing you can have. And if you can do all those things, if you're willing to do those things, you're going to be really successful in this business. And it's not going to always be the best day. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. But you know, if you got the work ethic, if you got the mentality, you'll get through it all, and 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 you'll make it big in this business. I love it. I love the story of the sacrifice, but also your persistence and, you know, it just says a lot about you and your commitment to this and commitment to really chasing down your dream. So uh, I congratulate you on that. Well, coach, uh, some awesome stuff you you shared here with us today, but uh, final question is, you know, you look at all the things you do as a coach. What's the one thing you do that gives your guys the winning edge? Um, Man, I think the biggest thing is just how prepared I, you know, it's just, everybody says, oh, it's just special teams. It's just special teams. It's just a third, it, you know, people say it's a third of the game. It's really not a third of the game. It's about 17% of the game, but I prepare myself to prepare our kids. Like it's a hundred percent of the game, right? I, I watch only special. I don't coach another position. I don't, but I watch every single play of every single phase of special teams i can't even tell you how many times i can't tell you how many times our head coach has tried to kick me out of my office here at nevada because he's like dude go home and i'm like coach no like there's something there you know what i mean and so i i think that's that's the best thing that i can do for our kids that's the best thing i can do is just over prepare and 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 do everything i can um, possible to make sure our kids are prepared and you know sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't um and maybe that's that uh, that is on me i, I got to find a way to even get even more prepared and be even better for our kids but i think just how we prepare me me and my quality control jack ray who played for me at arkansas pine bluff he, he came over here and he does a heck of a job helping me prepare we watch i i truly feel like man we i don't know how anybody watches more special teams film than me and him do i really don't and i'm sure there is but there might be but you know we try to prepare like we are responsible for every yard for every first down for for every second of every game and we're not like i said we're about 17 18 percent of the game depending on the year but that's that's how we're going to prepare and that's that's how we're going to do things with our detail and with our work ethic i think that's the number one thing that I bring to the table for, for not just our coaching staff, but for our kids. Coach, for our listeners out there, uh, what's the best way to connect with you? Uh, you can hit me on Twitter at Coach Chef underscore NV, like Nevada. Um, you can email me. My email is pretty simple. It's Thomas Sheffield at unr.edu. Um, and heck, I'm not afraid to give back. You get, you can have my cell phone number too, two five four, seven one five two one nine zero. Guys, please don't ever hesitate to holler at me. I want to learn from you. Just because I have Nevada on my chest doesn't make me better ball coach than you. It just makes me a luckier man. <laughs> uh, but but please don't hesitate to reach out. I love talking ball. I love answering questions. I love asking questions. And and at the end of the day. Um, we owe this game of football a lot. I owe this game of football a lot. If you're a young coach out there who just wants to learn, please don't hesitate to holler at me. Um, I, I would love to, to to give you some knowledge. And, and, and at the end of the day, maybe you can deliver some to me as well. Um, but, man, we're all in this together, and it's the greatest profession. It's the greatest profession. There's some guy sitting at a desk from 9 to 5 every day, miserable. We get to, we get to go outside and play. We get to go outside and play football every single day an unbelievable profession and i can't believe they pay us money to do it it's really stupid but um please don't hesitate i want to give back to this profession i want to give back to the young coaches i i, I want to repay the debt that i owe to so many so um gave you my my twitter my email and the number one no no i gave you my cell phone everybody <laughs> says don't ever give out your cell phone number i don't care man hit me up let's talk ball let's learn from each other um, and let's ride or die. And, and coach, uh, for our listeners, the areas that you recruit, if they have a guy, I recruit East Texas, uh, the 
California Bay Area, um, coastal the California coast area, and then um, Oklahoma as well. Coach, I really appreciate you taking the time. We will have your course from Lawrence first and goal up on Coach Tube soon, and uh, I'll share those links. You can find uh, those at coachingcoordinator.com. But I really appreciate your time, and best of luck to you and the Wolf Pack in 2021. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. And, uh, man, guys, go check out all that, all that material that they put out at that clinic. There's so much unbelievable uh, material out there. All these coaches really brought it, whether you're high school, college, NFL, you can learn something. I learned something. I learned a lot of things. So don't hesitate to get on there it's for a good cause um, and make sure you, 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 get, you bring your pen, and pen, your pen and paper and take some notes down. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five star for a rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.